Good morning. Our bell choir will introduce our service today for Reformation. While the bell choir is returning to their places and our organist to the organ, I'd like to thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel today. This is a convenience for you. Um, if you know someone in the deaf community who loves the Lord, please tell them about Grace Lutheran Church. Now, we're not a big church. But we do have Pastor Leader with us as a member of our congregation who has worked 40 years in deaf ministry. And for your convenience, he will sign the service in your presence. So if you know someone who is deaf and you'd like to get them to hear God's message, send them our way, okay? We're going to open our service this morning by singing My Faith Looks Up to Thee.
We begin in the name of the only true God, the God who saves the triune God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I am a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever committed you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy innocents that are suffering to death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful me. Upon this your confession, I, by the virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of God's word, announce his grace unto you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. And the Lord the poor shall not perish forever. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will give thanks. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. A stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning is now, and will be forever. Amen. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. And hope for the poor shall not perish Glory to be God on high. The Lord be with each of you. And with our spirit. Let us pray. O oh God, you have commanded us to love you above all things, and our neighbor as ourselves. Grant us the spirit to think and do what is pleasing in your sight, that our faith in you may never waver, and our love for one another never falter. 
We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. If you would, please be seated, and we will have our first two lessons. Our first uh, reading is from the Old Testament, from Leviticus, chapter 19, verses 1 through 2, and verses one, uh, 15 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Do not pervert justice, do not show partiality to the poor, or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is the epistle reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of, help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God, who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise for men, not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to, burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order to be a burden to anyone, we, to, or in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continuously, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but, it, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, our choir is going to bless us with how firm a foundation.
Because we are celebrating the Reformation today, I'm going to use a different gospel reading. So just listen to what the Word of God says. This is the gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter beginning with the 31st verse. Then Jesus said to those, those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, they answered him, We're Dave, uh, Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will make us free? Well, Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Here ends the gospel for this Sunday. Let us confess our faith in the triune God through the words of the Nicene Creed as we find it in our service handout. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of light, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, who was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He descended with Mary, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who is the Father and the Father and the Son, who let his power and his Son together is worshiped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. If you would, please be seated and join in singing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. We have five verses.
God's grace and his peace be with each of you this day through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I was listening to an individual that I thought was doing quite well um, in his commentaries. And then he made a comment that it was basically sinful to celebrate the Reformation. Well, it turned out that he was quite strong within the Roman Catholic Church in his beliefs. And it kind of has kind of put a wedge in my understanding of him and, and where he's coming from. Paul declared that he was chief of all sinners. He taught justification by faith. Faith in what Jesus Christ did for all mankind on Calvary. When he took our sin upon himself and Jesus nailed it to the tree through his crucifixion. Paul believed very strongly that he was saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And in Romans and in other areas of the scripture, he makes that very clear. By the power of the Holy Spirit working through him, the word of God's grace was proclaimed. Now this grace had to be reestablished in Jesus' day because the church of Christ's day had forgotten all about God's grace. They were steeped in the law. Well, Paul, that chief of sinners, and I believe he felt himself that way because at the beginning he persecuted the Christians, came to understand the forgiveness that we have in Christ. Well, over the years, unfortunately, the New Testament church reverted back to the same problems the Old Testament church was having when Jesus appeared. 1,500 years later, Luther comes on the scene, and he <laughs> kind of emulates Paul, and he places himself in that position of chief of sinners. And before he came to know the truth of the gospel, Luther spent long hours in the confessional trying to remember every possible sin that he had committed. And he anguished over this. And he became very irritated with himself, and that irritation grew. He understood the law, but he did not seem to understand what grace was all about. His idea of grace was skewed. Instead of receiving God's forgiveness, he was obsessed with the idea that if he died with unconfessed sin, he'd languish forever in purgatory or even worse, hell. And this languishing over sin consumed his days and also that of his confessor, a priest by the name of Staupitz. Grace was an unknown commodity in Luther's day. It was sold or worked off at the whims of the church. But as bad as it was then, just the opposite is taking place today. Today, many tend to overlook and minimize sin, as if sin makes no difference to God. That really, does God really care about sin? God's word classifies sin Yet the world sees it as an everyday occurrence. No big deal. 
Luther recognized his sin for what it truly was, an act of disobedience which separated him from God. And because of this separation, God hates sin above all things. Now, although Luther agonized over his sin, he wasn't the basket case that Rome tries to picture. He had quite a growing reputation as a professor and Bible scholar at the university that he was teaching. He was held in respect and high regard by many of his colleagues. And his teachings in his classes were helping to give prominence to the university at Wittenberg. As Luther was preparing for a series of lectures on uh, the book of Romans written by Paul, he was reading and studying chapter 3. Now, chapter 3 is extremely important. He had read this chapter for years. There was no TV back then, no internet. And so many put their endeavor into reading the Word of God. The problem was that this portion of Scripture that was, he was reading was going right over his head. It was as if he had a veil over his understanding. But today was different. As he read it, that veil that covered his understanding for so many years was ripped from top to bottom, just like the veil in the temple. And as the men on the road to Emmaus had an epiphany, so too did Luther have an eye-opening experience that day. This is how Luther uh, describes it. He says, it was as though the gates of heaven were open to me. Romans 3, 19 through 28, came alive in his head and his heart. This is what it said, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. Since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, they are now justified. Now that word justified means to be made right with God. By grace, God's grace, as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. For we hold, and this was what opened his heart we hold that a person is justified, remember, made right with God, by faith, apart from the works described by the law. Forever and ever, he was being told and taught it was through keeping the law, doing good works, that he would earn his salvation. And that's why he anguished over his sin. He could not continue to believe that his good works would save him. All he saw in the Lord law was his sin. But here, a person, it says, is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. In the gospel for the day that I chose, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. What did Jesus say about himself? Ego eimi, I am, I am. The what? The word and the what? The truth and the life. I am the word of the gospel that saves you. I am the truth of the word of God that saves you. And it is I who give you everlasting life. You will know the truth, he says, and the truth shall make you free. With opened eyes and the Holy Spirit understanding, Luther saw for the first time from God's word the truth of the gospel. 
And in that instant, he was set free. And the forgiveness he sought was his, and eternal life reigned within him. He was set free from the tedium of trying to justify himself to become worthy in the eyes of God. He finally came to recognize he could never have achieved what God so freely gave. All he did was continue to convict himself. But now, in the gospel, he finds his reconciliation. He finds forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. And he found out that it does not come through works it comes by the free gift of the grace of not a vengeful God as he had lived under, but a loving one, a caring one, a forgiving one. He was set free to rest in that grace, in the favor and the love of God, not because of what he accomplished, but because of the Son of God, for what Jesus did Grace, forgiveness freely given to us because of what Jesus accomplished at that cross, not by what we have accomplished. Luther did not discover the gospel that the church in Rome had lost or put aside. He rediscovered what had always been there. The good news of Jesus, who is the Christ, the Savior of man. Just though with so many today, with the word of God right in front of them, <coughs> there all along, but hidden, covered over by 1,500 years of misuse and tradition in the Roman church. And the truth of what, actually, it's only a 1,000 years because the first pope didn't come in until 400 years after the ascension. But the truth of the gospel is this. We are not saved. We are not righteous. We're not put right with God through being good and obeying the law. Why? Because nobody can obey the law. Even if I try and say, oh, look how good I am, I've already sinned. I've sinned because I reject the fact that I'm a sinner. We're not saved by our good works. We're not saved by keeping the hours. Well, we don't keep them, but others do. We're not saved by worshiping one way or another. We're saved by God's grace through Jesus Christ. We are saved solely by the grace of a loving God freely and generously given to us through the death and the resurrection of Christ himself. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that salvation comes to us as a free gift of God's grace, which we receive through faith. Faith says this, yes, Lord, I believe. Faith says, Lord, I receive you as my Savior. Faith says, I receive your grace as a gift of love and forgiveness. Faith says, thank you, Lord, for calling me by the gospel, enlightening me with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, so that I may believe. Thank you, Lord, faith says, for keeping me in the one true faith. Thank you, Lord, for loving and forgiving me continually in Jesus Christ. That's what phrase faith has to say. Coming alive through the gospel, the enlightened Luther was very eager to share what 
he had learned. In his tracts and in his sermons, he proclaimed the grace of God as a free gift to all, to the entire world. When he opened now the word of God, justification jumped out of the Bible. On every page, Luther saw the love of God in Christ. And he found that the Bible was consistent in that message. For once his eyes were opened to grace, he was able to recognize it everywhere. Not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well. For Luther and for us, God's promise was and is real. And because of the promise, it is essential to bring the message of salvation to all mankind. One pastor wrote that Luther thought that he'd have an audience among the church leaders who would be overjoyed in seeing this return of grace to the church. But instead, he was met, just as Jesus was, with resistance and persecution. The leaders of the church, from the bishop at Wittenberg to the pope in Rome, knew that to allow him to continue with his teaching of grace that this word would spread and they could end up losing their power to control the church. At that day, the governments in Europe, the people, not to mention a vast deal of revenue. They call Luther a heretic. Well, remember what Jesus says. They're going to treat us the same way as they treated him. They called him an outlaw. Everything possible that they could do to suppress his teaching, they tried. A bull was set against him. He was a wanted man, dead or alive. And a special blessing would go to those who killed him. His friends, though, kidnapped him took him to the castle at Wittenberg, where he walked the parapets daily. He was known as Junker George, Knight George. For two years he was there, and in that two years, he was blessed by God to do an amazing task of translating the Bible into German so that the people of Germany could read it for themselves and not have to rely on the interpretation of the bishop or the pope. Rome could not silence him. And they are still trying to. They actually have a program on TV called Not By Grace Alone, where they vilify the teachings of the Lutheran Church. Time Magazine, if I remember correctly, some years ago, um, put a list out, the 100 most influential people in history. Do you know where Luther showed up on that list? Showed up number four, if I remember correctly. Luther now, filled with the Holy Spirit, was the right man at the right time, in the right place, empowered by that spirit and armed with the truth of the gospel, the word of God. Gutenberg, his press was, was working at that time. He got a hold of a lot of Luther's writings and published them. And this infuriated the church even more. 
From the nailing of the 95 Thesis on the door of the church in Wittenberg and his proclamations, his tracts of the pure gospel of grace alone, by faith alone, through the word alone, the evangelical church of the Reformation was born. We know that church today as the Lutheran church. I think Lothar would probably roll over in the grave if he knew that because he wasn't trying to establish a Lutheran church but reform the church that he had grown up in. As Lutherans, we have the distinction of being the oldest and the largest non-Roman Catholic denomination in the world. You notice I don't use the term Protestant. That's a term applied by Rome to those who speak the words of grace. Well, we're reformed. It is sad, though, to know that still so many Lutherans, as well as other Christians, struggle with what Luther struggled with. <coughs> they grapple with doubts and questions, as did he so many years ago. What was lacking, what was missing in Luther's life, and what he discovered in the scripture is the assurance of salvation in Christ. He didn't need to worry anymore. And so many today need that same epiphany. He had discovered a loving, not a wrathful God. And this brought joy and hope to his life. And the lives of millions upon millions of people over the last 524 years. The law, law, L-A-W, the law and gospel became the watchword of the Reformation and drew so many to Christ. Through Christ, he and we have been set free from the condemnation that awaits all those who reject Jesus, who are dead in trespasses and sin, and who are trying to earn their own salvation by their good works. It is Christ who lived under the law and fulfilled it for us. It is Christ who took our sins to the cross and died for them, who made full payment for each of those sins. It is Christ who rose on the third day. It is Christ who ascended to the Father. It is Christ who rules heaven and earth right now, and it is Christ who will come again to judge both the living and the dead. Luther rediscovered the love and the grace of God through faith in Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the Godhead. He came to a realization of the joy and the hope that comes in knowing I'm saved. I'm loved, I'm redeemed, I am a child of God. Never forget, and let no one try to convince you that God doesn't love you. He has chosen you, and he has written your name according to Paul in chapter 1 of Ephesians. He's written your name in the book of life. That by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, you may know that you are fully forgiven and made a child of your heavenly Father, an heir and a co-heir with all who believe to the kingdom of glory in heaven. Each moment that God gives you, may you truly know and understand the joy of the forgiveness that you have and the salvation that is yours. You don't have to worry about the law. Christ fulfilled it. You don't have to worry about salvation. It's yours. Christ offers it to you. Believe that God gives you forgiveness, salvation, and everlasting life through faith. And you will partake of his glory in heaven forever.
Today, we celebrate the Reformation, a return to the truth of the gospel. Why would anyone say we shouldn't celebrate it? We should cherish it and revel in it every single day remembering our baptism, that we have been cleansed, that we have been made alive and new again in Christ, and that God has poured out his Holy Spirit upon us. Because no one can say that Jesus Christ is Lord without the Holy Spirit. Now may the peace of God, which truly surpasses all of our human understanding, may it keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. Um, I don't know if I stuck the offering here or not. Let's look. Yep. Uh, nope. Let's sing the offertory and then we'll have our offering. Yep. Yesterday, we had a Bible breakfast. I believe we had 16 all total? No, 12. 12? No, there was more than 12. You want me to count them for you? <laughs> well, you got to remember uh, there was children there, and Hunter was there, and we had everyone on the list, which was 15, except for Henry. So that meant we had 14, and if you add Hunter, that's 15. Okay, um, and, and so it was a great morning, great breakfast. We fed our bodies and we fed our souls. And we're going to do this again the last Saturday after hunting is all done in January. Okay, we're going to have another uh, Bible breakfast. We will be inviting the, um, what's it called, R.C.? The the what? Love Lady Circuit. The Love Lady Circuit of um, Methodist Church uh, to be with us. They have been with us for years prior to the pandemic. Please keep this in your prayers, because if we can add them, add a few more of ours, and bring ours up to. 18, 20, and have maybe a dozen from there, we'd have a pretty good turnout. So pray for this uh, breakfast Bible ministry and uh, look for it for the end of January of 2024, okay? Uh, it, we can't do it in November. We've got a lot of stuff going on. And in December, that's Christmas, so uh, it makes it difficult. So we will start in January, all right? Uh, if you would, please rise for prayer. God of grace, we look to you for our forgiveness, our salvation, and our eternal life. Bless us and keep us in your word. We pray for Jane and Jarrell, our shut-ins at the moment. Bless and keep them, Lord. Strengthen and preserve them. We pray for our nation in this troubling time when war seems to be on the brink. Give cooler heads, but let us never shirk from protecting those who are being 
overrun, attacked, and killed just because of their politics or their religion. Keep our leaders mindful of our duties, first to our citizens and then to others. Be with our Senate, our district, and our congregations. Let them be true to the gospel, to be preaching in season and out of season, never shirking from their duties to present grace to the world. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. for Brent, who seemed to have been coming along, but who has taken another turn in his treatment during this battle with leukemia, strengthen and preserve him. Be with Irene's brother, Billy, who also has a blood cancer or leukemia. And Steve, Sharon Cook's brother, strengthen them and use the medications that the doctors are prescribing to help them. Be with Mike, who has developed another lung cancer in the good lung. Help the doctors to care for him to deal with this cancer as they have with the others. Lord, in your mercy, for recovery for Veronica, for TC, who's not feeling well today, for Brian and for others, strengthen them and preserve them in your grace, Lord. Place your hand of strengthening and healing upon them. Lord, in your mercy, for Terrell, who's having a birthday, and Debbie also, give them another year of blessings to serve you, Lord. Be with our military members and family, for Austin and Brittany. We thank you for her promotion. Be with Nicholas and Marcus. Keep them safe from all harm and danger. And be with us, Lord, as we receive the body and the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, for the strengthening of our souls and for the forgiveness of all of our sins. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend those for whom we pray, trusting in your grace and praying that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, In that night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he gave it to them and he said, take and eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this as often as you can. In the same manner when they had supped, he took the cup and he blessed it. He gave it to them and he said, take and drink you all of it. For this cup is the New Testament in my blood for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as possible, remembering everything that I have done for you. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. If you would be seated, all is ready. Take and eat, for this is the blood of Christ. Take and drink. For this is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Now, may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Lord is peace and serve you. This is the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given into death for the of our sins. Now may this true body and blood strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and serve him. Now, 
May this true body and blood and this blessing strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and serve him. Take and eat, for this is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take and drink, for this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and serve him. If you would, please rise and let us continue with the non dementis. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his everlasting peace. Amen. 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 If you would, be seated and let us close with a mighty fortress. Amen. 